humble mug. Full disclosure, I received a review copy of Exophobia for both the PlayStation 5 and for Steam from the game's developer Zarkatech. However, all thoughts and opinions shared in this review are my own, and the devs were not allowed to watch this video prior to its publication. I put in well over 20 hours between both versions of these games, but the first section of this review will reflect my experience with the first 6 to 8 hours or roughly up to the halfway mark of playing Exophobia. Unfortunately, my experience did change at one point during my first attempted playthrough, so if you are interested in and like the looks of this game, I'd highly recommend you stay through to the end of this video so you get a clear picture of the game in its current state, especially on console. Ever since I joined Twitter, I've found a ton of promising indie games, and one of those games was Exophobia. It's a classic Doom-style boomer shooter with Metroidvania and puzzle elements, as well as a really eye-catching art style utilizing only nine different colors. Though it's officially releasing July 23rd, 2024, Exophobia actually has roots from as far back as 2015. Originally called Red Planet, this was the product of a weekend-long game jam done by Jose Casanera. Jose is a game developer out of Portugal who is basically the main man behind Zark Attack. Red Planet was unpolished of course being only a 3 day old video game, but it showed promise and so eventually after many iterations and brainstorming sessions, in 2019 the game was completely rebuilt in Game Maker Studio 2, renamed to Exophobia, and went into official development. So as I said, the game appears to be a boomer shooter of some sort at first glance, but it's also equal parts metroidvania, as there is a lot of backtracking that's necessary in order to get to your final destination. You'll find power-ups along the way that will allow you to get to previously inaccessible areas, handle enemies easier than you ever could before, and solve puzzles. It's not always clear where you need to go next, but exploration was generally always rewarding because oftentimes when I occasionally got lost and found myself doubling back through the same areas, I'd usually find a secret or two that I missed the first time around. If I had to describe it between the art style and the gameplay, I would say Exophobia combines elements of Doom, Wolfenstein, Metroid, and Mega Man, and there is a little bit of alien influence sprinkled in with some of the enemies, these guys in particular. Certain enemy and weapon designs and the general colorful palette of this game also reminds me of Apogee's Blake Stone if you've ever played that one before. <laughs> what separates this one from most of the games that came before it is its sliding mechanic. You can use it as a tool to evade, traverse, or even attack, it's very versatile. If you slide into an enemy, you can temporarily stun them. This will also work on shielded enemies too. Sliding into them knocks them off balance and allows you to take them down with your blaster, and the slide can also be used to swing yourself onto these zip lines, which is super fun. I wasn't using the slide too much at first, as I played Exophobia more like a traditional Doom type game, but once I warmed up to it and mastered the slide mechanic, I never went back. It feels really good to use, and it keeps the gameplay fresh and exciting as you're constantly dancing between getting up in your enemy's face and getting yourself safely out of harm's way. Though the game's DNA is rooted most in Doom and Wolfenstein, the sliding mechanic can at times feel a lot more like Quake or Dusk's bunny hopping. And so even though you can only aim left to right like it's 1993, the slide really helps modernize the game feel. If you get the rhythm down, you can seamlessly move left to right quickly, sliding right after you recover from the previous slide, and especially when you get to a portion of the game where you're being chased by a creature that you can't kill, this slide hopping is extremely useful and feels great to take advantage of. The bosses are pretty tough, and there are challenge rooms requiring you to face waves of enemies to progress, and both the bosses and the challenge rooms will make effective use of everything you've learned thus far, so good luck and get sliding. The fact that you can charge up and hold your weapons blast, and considering that you'll also be sliding around like crazy, that's where that Mega Man flair I mentioned earlier really shines, by the way. Another thing that I really like about this game is that there are a ton of secrets to discover. Some will give you CDs that you can load into the terminal for optional lore dumps, enemy bios, or tips and tricks on the game mechanics, or how to find more secrets. Also, it's within these terminal rooms that you'll heal up and save Metroid style, and you can view the map of this gargantuan alien spaceship to get your bearings and plan the next mode of attack. While traveling around on foot, you can view the map, but your map has a battery attached to it and it will die on you if you're not careful and overuse it. And this gives the game a bit of a tense survival element and encourages you to really explore on your own. Of course, coming back to the terminals will also charge your personal map back up, but I will say it dies pretty quickly. 
I personally didn't have a huge problem with this, but I could see other people getting bothered by that. So earlier I described the spaceship as gargantuan, and that is not an exaggeration, as there is so much to explore, and there are four floors to this thing too, that each have a totally different feel from one another, so you're going on quite the journey. Once you find an elevator, you can explore any of these floors at any point in the game, which leads to a very open exploration experience, but it's up to you to find out the critical path and where you need to go next to move the story forward. I will say, just as a general tip, Tip though, if you discover a new elevator that you've never been on before, go ahead and take it because the elevators you find are instrumental to progressing the story. Occasionally I would go back and backtrack and then kind of get myself lost. Trust me, just take the elevator. I don't want to spoil too much in the way of abilities or how the story progresses since it's an exploration game that benefits the most from, well, your own exploration. But I will say there was an ability I got about three to four hours into the game that gave me so much satisfaction because not only does it allow you to get through previously impenetrable barriers, but it also easily dispatches some of these more annoying bug enemies as well as certain enemies I previously thought were unkillable. The game does a great job in the sense of making you feel more powerful when you get the occasional upgrade to your blaster. There are also temporary upgrades you can find like armor packs that buff your health or jetpacks that allow you to slide around indefinitely without any cooldown. And let's just say that if you like little companion characters that help you fight like the pets in Gauntlet Dark Legacy, the mags in Fantasy Star Online, or the drones in Helldivers 2, Exophobia has a cute little guy waiting to help you out and you'll want to protect them with all of your being. And now for this section of the review, I wanted to cover some of the issues that I hinted at during the beginning of this video. Zark Attack is a small indie studio, literally, it's a three-man team. And this is the first game of this size and scope that they've ever made, so some issues can arise with that, and I'm obviously willing to take that into consideration. I did, however, find two issues in my playthrough that playtesters didn't actually run into themselves, and the devs did confirm to me that they'll be working on these patches to address these issues. The PC release shouldn't take too long to patch, but the devs did confirm to me that it'll take a bit longer to distribute these patches to the console versions. And it's with the console versions specifically where the biggest issue is. The first issue came from the jetpack power-up. Earlier I mentioned that if you get a jetpack in the game, it can give you temporary infinite boosts. If you die, you lose the jetpack. The problem is, I didn't die for a long time and I made it much further than expected with the jetpack intact. The problem with this is somehow the jetpack actually messes with the collision detection in a section of the game where you're supposed to push these barrels, and so I wasted a lot of time trying to figure it out because I thought maybe it was an error on my part. After literally hours of trying to brute force my way through this section and just deciding I either must be doing something wrong or something else is happening, I decided to provide footage showing the issue I had, and eventually we figured out that it must be some kind of collision detection issue. Zarkitek provided me a workaround and confirmed that they would be working on it to fix it as a day one patch. And I think that speaks volumes to how passionate the small team is about their game and that they're striving to make this a positive experience for everyone. If you happen to have this game and run into this issue and it's not quite been patched yet, all you have to do is save and then go to the pause menu, restart from the last checkpoint, and the jetpack will be gone. This allowed me to move forward quick and easy and so I was on my way. Unfortunately, about two hours later into the game I encountered my second issue and there just simply isn't a quick and easy way around this right now. Again, this might already be patched on the PC version by the time I'm talking about this, but I played this and discovered this issue on the PS5 version, so in its current state, there's a possibility that you will run into this too on console. To make a long story short, I basically defeated a boss, and this zipline here is supposed to take me to the next area, but as you can see, there's no hook for me to grab onto. I must have used the zipline earlier at some point in the game, and it never reset positions, so... I essentially softlocked myself about 50-60% to 60 of the way into the main campaign and would have to start all over again if I wanted to get past this point. This was admittedly extremely frustrating, but again, I understand we're talking about the biggest project that the small staff has worked on to date. After we did in fact confirm that I was in a softlock situation, I talked with the developer and they ended up giving me a Steam version of the game. I'm happy to confirm that I did play through the Steam version of that game with no issues, and knowing that this version of the game is going to get patched at a quicker rate, do I think Exophobia is worth a purchase? On the PC? Absolutely. If you're a console player, however, and you're interested in this game, I would probably wait a month or two and keep up with the patch notes. I can't in good faith recommend this game right now to console players as much as I enjoyed many aspects of it, but I can confirm that these guys are diligent workers who want to make sure that they're delivering a good product. And these issues weren't discovered until the 11th hour. This thing still arrived to us in a better state than Cyberpunk, Master Chief Collection, or No Man's Sky Day 1, but make no mistake, I'm not excusing the issues I came across. They were really frustrating. 
With that said, with the exception of one specific area, Exophobia did run at a buttery smooth 60 frames for me at pretty much all times, and it's a super convenient download at a whopping 352 megs, so it's easy to add to your collection, and digitally, it's priced at $15, which I think is a great deal for the amount of content you get. I think certain indie games kind of miss that mark at times by pricing themselves right off the bat at $25, $30, or $35. That's not to say that those games aren't worth it, but there is so much competition nowadays, and indie games especially go on sale so often that I feel like people have been trained to wait. I was fully expecting a $20 or above price tag for this game after I played it, so I think $15 is a really good deal personally if you're picking this up on PC. When it came to those first 6-8 to eight hours of gameplay with this game, I was really impressed. At first I thought, sure, this will probably be a fun little experience that I'll pick up and play every now and then, but probably not something that was going to blow me away. But what I actually got once I had my hands on this game was a visceral run and gun experience with a strong but fair amount of challenge that really holds its own amongst some of my other favorite shooters of its kind. I told myself that I would never give anything numerical ratings when reviewing games, but to give you an idea in case that helps you, the first half of this game was a solid like 8 out of 10 for me. There are some occasionally annoying enemies or rooms here and there, but what boomer shooter doesn't have that? One thing I will say though, and especially when you get to the last half of this game, some of the puzzles are really obtuse and confusing, like cross-code puzzle difficulty, which I was not expecting and it didn't always work for me to be honest. The game does not hold your hand by any means, there is very minimal instruction on how to do things, and that is something that I definitely respect as a design decision, but there were some times where I thought the puzzles were kind of frustrating and they're the kind of puzzles that once you figure out like what you're supposed to do you can usually complete it pretty quickly but getting yourself in the mindset of okay this is how I should do this puzzle that takes time and I'm someone who typically overcomplicates problems and so often what I thought I had to do was usually more complicated than what the actual solution was. So part of this is a problem on my end but I know that a ton of people are going to get stuck on these puzzles. The benefit though is that once you do get past them, you're usually rewarded with some kind of killer boss fight, especially when you get to the core boss, that was one of the coolest boss fights I've ever seen. And admittedly, when you solve some of these puzzles or find secrets, you feel really smart, and that's evidence of good game design. The game is much more metroidvania than you might expect upon first glance, so if you want a simple boomer shooter non-stop violence romp, maybe go for something like Ultra Kill or Dusk. But in the moments where this game really finds that blend of metroidvania and old school shooter and clicks with you, it's really fun. And while I really enjoyed my time with the PC version, it is a shame that I wasn't able to get further with the console version. I'm hopeful that the game will be in a better state in the future. Overall, I thought that Exophobia is a gem of a game that I hope gets the attention it deserves. When the game is at its best, it feels like a really cool marriage between Metroid and Doom, and considering I'm hot off the heels of my first time experience with Metroid Dread, I'd say that's still high praise. The pastel -y kind of art style really reminds me of like Mega Man Legends or something similar, and I'm sure just from watching you see how much this art style pops. Overall, I'm super thankful for Zark Attack for giving me my very first review code Code, for all the troubleshooting that they did, and for all of the work that they're doing to address the concerns that I found. If you're still here, thanks so much for watching, and as always, stay humble.